Alright, so initially on this video, I was also going to be talking about, uh, if Beale Street could talk and can you ever forgive me, but given the time constraints that I have, I think I'm just going to do the favorite by itself uh, to at least get through all the picture nominees, and then uh, maybe when an Eternity's Gate comes out in a couple of weeks, I'll tackle all those, but uh, in the meantime, we'll just go into this one. Uh, which, as I mentioned before, this was actually uh, a couple of days ago, was my second time seeing it, because I just wanted to... When I came out of it the first time, I liked it, but I wasn't completely in love with it, and I sort of felt like I really feel like if I see this a second time, I can really get a better grasp on it and some of the more you know nuanced and subtle things in there. And I'm really glad I did, because I do actually... Um, it was much better a second time, and there were plenty of things I was able to catch more so this time around. But to um, start off with, obviously it comes from uh, Yorgos Lanthimos, which... He, he, the interesting thing about this is that um, he obviously has a very distinct style with stuff like Dogtooth and Killing of a Sacred Deer, the Lobster, and uh, Alps. Um, and this is, like, I think the first time in a while that uh, it hasn't been his own script that he's worked with. Um, but the whole movie still feels like him, like, right down the line. Uh, even the dialogue and, like, how you know, biting and venomous it can be and stuff like that. Uh, even the a moment, um, a crucial moment where Emma Stone starts beating herself in the face with a book sort of brings back memories of uh, the self-inflicted disfigurements that ended Dogtooth and the Lobster. Um, but um, there's still something about this that was also felt like totally off his path also, particularly the... Uh, I guess the period setting, um, which was something the movie kind of initially had going against it with me, because obviously the whole period drama and costume drama and all that stuff is like my least favorite genre, but you add you add in the stuff that they add in uh, to this, and also the fact that there's kind of another genre going on here, which is one of my absolute favorites, which is they've somehow inserted a dark comedy into all this. Um, the darkest of comedies, um, which you could... You can sort of take away from some of Lanthimos' other movies, depending on how you view them. Uh, some like The Lobster are a bit more intentional, but yeah, there, it almost feels like there's some sort of dark sense of humor in a lot of his stuff. Um, so you look at it, and it's like this whole thing of... It's obviously very elegant-looking and very sort of well-dressed on the outside, uh, but on the inside, there's definitely, like, a really twisted and grotesque heart to it. <laughs> um, so, you look at the... Start off with, like, the three central performances where you've got uh, Olivia Colman as Queen Anne, and there's a lot more that she's doing than I'd realize the first time around. Um, like, obviously, you know, at the start, you sort of see this... Well, actually, more so gradually as it goes, you start to see somebody that's sort of worn down by sickness, but also tragedy, uh, we learn later, particularly the scene where she introduces Stone to the Rabbits. Um, but what we get kind of right away is this very uh, childlike way about her, like these childlike tantrums. Um, and the way that uh, Rachel Weiss deals with those and sort of bounces off of them, and it's like we sort of get to immediately see a bunch of different sides of her, because we start off with that, but then as Vice sort of starts to, like, degrade her, um, it, al it almost kind of seems cruel in a way. Um, but, like, like the moment when she says that her makeup looks like a badger, and we can see how hurt Coleman is and Vice's response, as if she's, you know, seen this over and over and over again and dealt with it over and over again, um, is, are you going to cry, really? And just that delivery of it kind of says, you know, we've been doing this a long time, and there's a sort of lived-in feel immediately with those two with scenes like that, um, and the way that her, the other aspects of her character sort of always come back out, like, that's immediately followed up with the look at me moment, um, so, yeah, and the way she has to juggle with all that stuff, but there's also a lot of, um, actually, it, on both sides of this, um, there's a lot of really subtle stuff, and a lot of stuff that's, like, has to be right there, like, there's a, there's a lot more physicality to this part, than you may think, uh, just looking at the role on the surface, um, especially as her, you know, actual physical being starts to get more a little hard to carry. Um, but then there's stuff that's, like, really small, but extremely powerful, like when she's, um, 
starting to have like fits of jealousy throughout the movie, particularly the scene where she's watching Rachel Weiss and Joe Allen have this really bizarre dance sequence. Um, something that may have seemed totally out of place in another movie like this, um, but this movie is just so fucked up at its core. Like this dancing is like, yeah, I was just waiting for something like this to happen, <laughs> uh, and it's amazing. Um, but the way Coleman's expression changes in this scene as she's watching this happen, going from just sort of being at this party to this event happening and causing a stir inside her that is not good, um, and just watching her face sort of drop into an entirely different expression, and it's like, it's so internalized but so visible to us at the same time, uh, and stuff like that is really skillful. Um, but going on that also, we talk about the Vice character, who um, Coleman even explains to her later she finds very mean and uncaring most of the time. And of course, in the true fashion of her character, Vice tries to back that up by saying, uh, yeah, but most of the time I'm like really lovely. Um, but we never really see that. Uh, so it's like, this, it would be to her character to just sort of see herself that way, um, despite the fact that we never do. Um, and to me, anyway, she's a character that's, like, that character that you kind of love to hate. Because even though, like I said, we get the sense of that just sort of brutal rapport they have, and where that probably stems from, um, there's still just something about Vice's character that just really gets under your skin, and it's, it is in an effective way that might sound, uh... Like, it goes in a different direction, given that I've stated many, many times over that um, Rachel Weisz is not my favorite actress at all, <laughs> by any means. Um, I understand how beloved she is, but I've just never been a fan. But um, I do like what she's doing here, especially since she's able to play that so well. And then, without really saying anything, um, there is a certain moment towards the end with her character that's sort of in a totally different direction than we'd expect this character to do. Like, just one action. Um, and the way she's able to sell that sort of left turn that this character does, um, without seeming like the character is going completely, you know, a out of itself. Um, I do, I do, I did think that was handled really well, too. It actually gives, um, her character kind of a really powerful last few moments or so before the movie ends. Um, and then that's, uh, that's probably the most I've ever complimented Rachel Weisz in my life, <laughs> so, um, going on to Stone, uh, the third character that just literally drops into the story, out of a carriage and into the mud, um, there is, um, I, I've been criticizing Stone a bit lately, too, particularly after her Oscar win, where I've been saying that she used to sort of feel like, you know, one of the most natural actresses on Earth, but then it seemed like around the time she won her Oscar and afterwards a lot of her performances have started to feel very, like, mechanical, and, like, they basically scream, I'm acting. Um, but she does find a certain thing here, especially, uh, much like the other characters, the personality kind of has to bounce around a little bit, especially as this character kind of gradually gets from one point to the other. And for most of the movie, you're kind of asking yourself, when she gets to the way that the character is more so in the second half than she is the first. Uh, your your thought process is kind of like, now was that always inside her, or did we watch her progressively get from there? Um, and it's something I still haven't quite figured out, but um, which I think says something about the performance. That's not necessarily a criticism. Um, it makes the character extremely interesting, but also um, the first time I wasn't able to buy too much when the character got more, you know, deceitful and power hungry. Uh, I thought she was much more convincing when she was kind of like more, you know, sympathetic. Like this, once again, the scene with uh, the rabbits and Coleman where we actually see like a genuine sincerity come out of her. Um, and more so towards the beginning also. But like I said, it is really interesting to look back after you know the whole arc of the character and it's like was she power hungry the whole time and all that um because like i said those moments really are genuine but you do see the change from one scene to the other but especially in scenes that seem to mirror each other but kind of you know throwing those turns like um the first time when she and vice are out shooting the birds and she, as she raises the gun she's got like that genuine look of remorse on her face harming a bird 
Um, and then the next time they're out there doing that, we sort of see the, like, when the blood splatter hits Vice and all that, and we easily see the character change that has happened since the last time they were there. So, well, there is another scene in the middle also uh, that involving shooting the birds, which is really nice, too, and a great moment for Vice's character. Um, when we realize that um, a certain secret has come forth that Stone is not supposed to know, but does. Um, so, uh, and as far as other cast members, um, Joe Alwyn is surprisingly fine here. Uh, it's, he's, he is kind of stuck in this whole land this year with also being a Mary Queen of Scots. Uh, I much prefer him in this, though, as well as uh, Nicholas Holt, of course, um, where... He, like, despite the fact that, um, the main three actresses, like, really, really just own this movie, um, I was really surprised by how much Holt stands out on his own as well. Um, it kind of basically, to simplify it, uh, for the sake of time, um, he's basically coming in and rustling everything. Uh, and everybody, like, he's trying to get in all different sides so that he can base everybody in one way or another, is trying to get, uh, or influence Coleman's power so that they can, you know, go on their own agenda. Um, and the way he just sort of bounces off all these people, uh, in this very comedic way, he's like such a, is, is a really comedic performance, which I was not expecting, um, which is amazing. He can just say, like, one word, one, even, in some cases, one specific word, uh, just by itself, and it's just like the perfect delivery um, and, and just his attitude towards the whole thing is just, and he's got this whole thing, uh, he's basically got a running gag with Stone, the whole shoving her thing, um, and so I, I just really did love this character, and even when he, and, and it wasn't even that distracting, it was like one time where it was like, he gets right up in Rachel Weisz's face, was the one time it occurred to me, wow, this is the weirdest about a boy reunion ever, um, so... Yeah, so the whole cast uh, is great, not just the main three actresses, but um, as far as how well the movie is made, as you can probably guess, with the ten Oscar nominations, um, the cinematography actually, while some of it is, like, you know, brilliant, of course, um, the first time I saw it, it was actually a bit, um, I thought it was a bit much. Um, the second time around, I was kind of able to appreciate it more, but I think it's because I was expecting it. But the fact that because the thing about the whole, you know, period movie is I'm always, you know, probably saying, like, you need to liven this up a little bit. And so what better, what more interesting, unexpected way to liven up a period drama by having a camera that almost never sits still? Uh, you can see where this might be jarring at first if you're not expecting it. Um, and sometimes I thought it was maybe a bit overkill, particularly... Um, like, as, as far as, like, you know, the going down hallway shots or the, you know, the horses going down a pathway shots are fine, but then it got to stuff like, there's a point in time where um, Holt starts talking, and the camera's already on him sitting on a couch with another dude, and when he starts talking, the camera moves to where he's just the one in the frame, and then it, like, pushes in on him, and it was just kind of this whole, that was kind of when I realized, like, good lord, the camera will not sit still. Um... But, but like I said, there is something that actually does work better than I had thought what thought it was. But um, there was still, but even so, there are still shots like um, when Holden Stone are walking on the in the dark, and they're on, the only thing you can see is like fire around them, whether it be candles or torches or whatever, which is a really great shot. So it reminded me of uh, the shot in Twelve Years a Slave when. Uh, Fassbender confronted Chiwetel Ejiofor outside. Um, but and another thing that's actually really great about this is the way that um, the cinematography and the production design are like working together uh, to kind of show each other off. Because a lot of the a lot of the time when the camera actually is sitting still, and sometimes even when it's not, um, it's like sort of below the characters. Like it's hardly ever like up here with them or. He, above them for whatever reason that would be um so it's like we're always sort of looking up at them um like i said e even when it's like you know tracking with them but the thing is is um it really also shows off just how massive 
these sets are like you can see just how high you know and big everything is from this you know almost constant viewpoint um, look, and, and it's not even just in those moments either, um, like every single thing about this just looks enormous. And it's one of those cases where I have, um, maybe I'm warming up to this genre a little bit, because I feel like I've said this a few times already, but, or I, I'm just getting used to it, but usually, um, when you get to movies like this that are in like this sort of period era, uh, one of the problems I often had with them was that they just, you could always sense that they seemed like sets and actors and costumes just acting uh, and it didn't really feel like anything particularly real um, but it's like there's no sign whatsoever of modern times uh, in this world even casting an actress that seems as uh, sort of modern as Emma Stone like you would think would throw that off but for everything from her to all that just feels absolutely of the era um, especially Coleman um, it just seems like she's just basically lifted out of history and put on screen, uh, and just, it, it, that's, so that's something that, uh, I absolutely had no problem with, which is usually one of my main beats with the genre, so that helped a lot. Um, and then there is, oh, I get, yeah, there's the one thing. Um, I, I don't know, maybe I'm just missing something, um, but even after seeing it twice, um, I don't really get the fisheye thing. Uh, I know that was actually something that a lot of people brought up as something that I thought was like, sort of gave it like this really unique and sort of weird feel, and that is the sort of thing, like the, the score helps with that too. Like at first I kind of felt the score was like almost gratingly repetitive, but then I started to think that's probably the point in the way it just really sets the really weird atmosphere of this and the whole thing is just, that's what I kept hearing about its Oscar buzz long before it got like a wider release. Everybody was saying it's too weird to do well at the Oscars, which even with Lanthimos' name attached to it, it was like, I wonder how, but y you get a sense of it. Like, weird's a good word for this movie, but not in a negative sense by any means. Um, so, and like I said, if you, just to really like liven up this genre in general, all those approaches are like, yeah, I'm on board with them, so, but I, I, I still think, I, I wasn't quite sure about the fish, I think, I still don't know that I get that entirely, but, um, it's, it's fine, it wasn't, like, constant or anything, so it had that going forward, um, and then there's also, uh, the editing, because there is, I mean, there's the one thing about, you know, just in general, the way it's, you know, cut together, the only, as far as pacing goes, the only time it starts to really, it doesn't really start to feel its length until maybe the last 20 minutes where it seems like we reach a couple of good wrapping up points but it just kind of keeps going just a little bit um but it's easy to forgive because the last shot is so incredible but um speaking of the last shot this is also kind of in with that but i actually want to go back to a very early scene where in, in, they start using sort of dissolves instead of the traditional cutting in particular a sort of montage that happens um, where they've played a prank on Stone because she's new there and she's burned her hand while at the same time the Queen's having a gout attack and they cut back and forth between them like there, like there's one shot of Stone unbandaging herself as it's a dissolve into the Queen being bandaged uh, and then there's the whole thing of Stone going out into the woods and finding something to treat it um, and then she figures out that not, not only is it like this isn't just her treating herself and then finding a way to treat the queen also but this is like her way in like entirely like this is the turning point for where stone goes for the rest of the movie um is this discovery and the way it's kind of shown all in this one seeming blob of dissolves just sort of constant um i found really interesting and kind of really illustrated the whole thing of like not only is this like a crucial turning point, but it's all sort of got the same sort of purpose to it. Um, so I thought that was really interestingly done also. Um, another thing that uh, the movie handles in an interesting way, and Lanthimos in general, you'll notice if you look at his body of work, is just sexual subject matter in general. 
Uh, like you look at, you know, Dogtooth, for instance, and Dogtooth was like really in your face. Uh, I think the word unsimulated was thrown around uh, in regards to the making of it. Um, then you've got like, you know, this the implied sex scenes in Killing of a Sacred Deer, which felt a bit distant. Uh, where it's like, there was Colin Farrell and Nicole Kidman in the bed, but the camera felt like it was really far away from them, uh, and felt distant, obviously intentionally. And this is another entirely different approach from either of those two, um, where it's, it's somewhat in your face, but also not. The one time it's like only implied and not actually shown is when it's between two people that are like, in actual, there's like actual passion, um, and it's it's like this hidden forbidden thing and all that. But then the rest of it, when we do kind of get more of a glimpse of it, um, it's like really sort of sleazy and dirty, not necessarily in the good way, in almost like a De Palma sense. Um, and a lot of the time, it's either it's either very nonchalant in one particular scene, or it's two people doing it as a means of, like, using it as a weapon against a third party, uh, whoever that may be. Um, and I found that really interesting, also, the way that he can actually use sex as a subject matter in, like, so many different fashions. Um, and, it, and the fact that it's so especially crucial in this case, uh, and the different approaches to that. So, yeah, that's, that's worth noting. Um, if there's one thing about the way it's split up, um, I, I wasn't quite sure about the whole chapter thing. I'm still not quite sure what exactly the purpose of that might be. And it is kind of one of those cases where, like, each, you know, chapter title is a line that's going to be coming, and it's like, it's, all it really does is make you anticipate that line. <laughs> um, it doesn't really feel like it serves too much of a purpose, but, um, I don't know, maybe I'll figure that out with another viewing or something, but, um... So yeah, and obviously, you know, there's a whole sort of somewhat satirical angle where it's like them sort of recognizing the absurdity of the whole setting, particularly uh scene where Joel Allen has one of the wigs that uh, all the guys are wearing, and then the scene ends with him just saying, this wig is ridiculous, by the way, and just ripping it off. Um, <laughs> so there's certain things like that that aren't too beat you over the head with it, but sort of acknowledge that kind of thing. Um... I guess the last thing I really want to note that I found interesting was, this kind of goes on with the sex thing too, was, um, and the sense of, I don't know if violence is the right word in this, but it's, yeah, the characters are cruel to each other in one way or another, and sometimes to themselves even. Um, but there was something about, particularly when you look at like, um, Dogtooth and the Lobster and the Killing of the Sacred Deer. I, I really don't remember much about Alps. I saw it when it came out, and it just kind of came on one out of my head, but I'll have to revisit it now that um, he's become so prominent. But um, it seems like in this movie, he's not near as seeming, seemingly emotionless towards his characters as he usually is. Um, where, like, the characters really get the time to, like, feel something, and what they feel towards each other just kind of plays such a huge part in the story that it feels, like, significantly more prominent than it usually does. Um, and it just sort of seems like his, like, the lob the lobster, obviously, and Killing of a Sacred Deer also, where it's, like, this intentional, just complete absence of emotion, seemingly. Um, I guess you could, you know, talk uh, Dogtooth up to that also, but, uh, yeah, so I felt like that was kind of a different turn here for him also. So it's, like, in so many ways, it feels like it's totally off his path, but then at the same time, it's like just him all over, uh, which is great. So, yeah, so I, I definitely recommend seeing this more than once if you don't take to it immediately. Um, and you, because and you, obviously I kind of went in a bit against it the first time, because it was a, you know, period piece movie with Rachel Weisz in it, so, <laughs> um, much as I love Olivia Colman and everything, and I'm really glad to see her in, like, this leading role, I'm really glad the studio had the balls to keep her in leading throughout the award season, too, so that's really great that she gets that kind of acknowledgement, especially for work like this, so, yes, that's how I see this, and that's the last Best Picture nominee I need to talk about, so... 
Um, like I said, maybe I'll get to those other three in a couple of weeks or something, um, much as I would like to just finish up 2018. Um, next, we're going to do uh, some Netflix stuff like Velvet Buzzsaw, and I'm going to probably try to get to some of the other ones that have been released in this past month, so uh, to add on to that. And then we got, you know, Versus stuff and award stuff still going on, so all of that. So uh, until all that stuff, I think that's it for this.